I suddenly realised that actually all that stuff philosophically I've been doing around the concept of sovereignty, around law and violence and friend and enemy and states of emergency and all this sort of stuff, superheroes were this perfect prism for analysing all of those concepts, right? Demonstrating them, illustrating them. And not just that, superheroes were very good at really pr problematizing some of those issues. Welcome to the Research and Reason podcast. Join us as we discuss the latest research, news, and opinion from arts academics at the University of Auckland. Kia ora koutou. Ko Julianne Evans, toko ingoa. I'm the media advisor for the Faculty of Arts, and I'm talking to Neil Curtis, a professor in media and screen studies in the School of Humanities. Neil has a particular interest in cartoons and graphic storytelling, and most recently, graphic medicine, which uses comics to tell personal stories of illness and health. Kia ora, Neil, and welcome. Thanks for coming in. Kia ora, Julianne. Thank you very much for having me. Starting a bit further back, what brought you, an academic originally from the UK, um, with a background in interesting things like political theory, critical theory, cultural politics, and social media, to discover comics? Um, I suppose it was during my PhD, when I was writing my PhD, I was reading so much theory, so much philosophy, so much academic material that I'd kind of seemed to have lost time to read any fiction. And uh, so I thought, hey, why don't I go to the comic shop, see if I can get some little short slice of fiction. And um, yeah, they introduced me to the 300 issue epic called Cerebus. So I didn't get a, wasn't quite a small slice of fiction. It was a massive one. What is Cerebus? Um, it's a comic written written and drawn by a guy called Dave Sim. I think he's Canadian, and it's an independent comic, so it's self published. Um, it's quite an incredible thing. It's kind of built, as I say, built over three hundred issues, but it's it's really once he gets the story going, it's one big story. Cerebus is an aardvark. Um, who lives in his own kind of strange world that also has various cultural figures in it, like Mick Jagger, I think, appears in it at some point. But it's a comic that references all these different cultural aspects. And it, and I, it, it was a, a I realised it's a great piece of literature, right? But by, by any standards, it's an incredible piece of literature. It's visually innovative it's innovative in terms of the comics medium narratively it's incredibly innovative as well so it's an amazing piece of work but I never actually finished that because by the time I got to issue 200 the misogyny that had been bubbling under the surface of the comic suddenly came to fruition and I remember throwing the comic across the room and I haven't read the final 100. So I was reading it, I was I was collecting the issues as they came out, but I was reading the, the collected editions, right? So by the time I got to the point where I was buying the single issues, I haven't read them, so. What um, period of time are we talking about? We're talking um, probably 1992, around uh, early 90s. Um, and I just became fascinated then, and it just took off, I just became interested. Um, because I didn't know much about comics. I hadn't been a comics reader when I was a kid, apart from the Beano and the Dandy and stuff, you know, these sort of English staples. Um, and I, I was fortunate. I had a particularly brilliant comic shop in Nottingham called Page 45, which I'd imagine is probably the best comic shop in the country. And um, they just kept introducing me to things and I just kept picking stuff up. And before I knew it, I was collecting all this stuff and reading all this stuff. And it, it I haven't stopped reading ever since so that's where it started really and then how did you make the leap between things that you found interesting to read in your spare time with thinking this could be something that I could do in my academic life well, I suppose that's the link that's the link that goes back to the kind of cultural studies link um, and the and cultural studies is a sort of interdiscipline of sort of English anthropology philosophy literature science and technology studies, all kinds of things. But cultural studies is really ab about 
um, to sort of witnessing, um, identifying, advocating for things from the margins quite often. Right, so cultural studies is kind of it was off, um, really inspired by a kind of Marxism that was interested in working class, working class production. So popular culture, right, as opposed to this ridiculous thing we call high culture, right. So it was about investigating and researching popular forms of of culture, right. Um, and so I was teaching at the University of Nottingham, which is the university I I came from when I came here. And it was a media and communication program we had there. So I met a, a colleague there, a woman called Tracy Potts, fantastic uh, woman and a great scholar. She was interested in comics. And I think in that spirit of cultural studies, we decided to try and introduce comics as a medium, right? Because it was a medium that had been excluded, right? It was overlooked. And we saw great value in it. So we started a, a, a comics course there. And then what happened was really a weird thing because I'd been buying all these kind of arty-farty independent alternative comics at my comic shop. And we wrote this course in comics and it was all kind of literary, artistic, alternative, independent stuff. And then we didn't have anything on superheroes. And I said, well, we can't really do a course on comics and not have a session on superheroes. And as you said in the introduction, I was doing lots of work on political theory, critical theory, and I was interested in um, issues around sovereignty, kind of relationship between law and violence and that sort of that, that, that sort of philosophical area. And I said, I said to Tracy, I said, I, I must be able to use this stuff and write a lecture on Batman, because <laughs> Batman seemed to be the epitome of this kind of alloy between law and law and violence. Right. So. Um, I went down to the comic shop and I said, okay, I want some superhero books. And they all kind of laughed at me, you know, I said, oh, what are you reading that rubbish for? So I said, this is what I want to do. And they said, oh, well, okay, you should may maybe have a look at that and ha maybe have a look at that. And so I started reading these superhero books. And within, I think, six months, I had a proposal for a book. And within 12 months, I had a contract for a book. You know, so it suddenly exploded. I suddenly realized that actually all that stuff philosophically I've been doing around the concept of sovereignty, around law and violence and friend and enemy and states of emergency and all this sort of stuff. Superheroes were this perfect prism for analyzing all of those concepts, right? Demonstrating them, illustrating them. And not just that, superheroes were very good at really pr problematizing some of those issues right um so particularly you know you, you look at someone like batman right he's not just the law in relation to the criminal's violence he is also the instigator of violence right so he he starts to become that symbol of the as i said the alloy between law and violence and it also then allows us to start thinking critically about the nature of the law and what is the law and this idea that law is purely pacific, right? When in fact it is extremely violent, right? Is Batman horrible to his enemies though, is he? Is that, is that the thing? Yeah, I mean, the key mm. thing about Batman, of course, is he never uses a gun. Right. Which is odd for uh, uh, America, of course. But that's because his parents were shot, right? So, and, and murdered with a gun. So he never uses a gun, but he uses all kinds of other violence, right? Um, and he operates in this this sort of weird space right between what's legal and what's illegal right and again it's a really interesting prism for looking at the nature of of law and for critiquing very simplistic views of that law is all about peace right and about goodness when in fact we know in many instances the law is can be profoundly violent particularly when it, it acts in a sovereign manner so i ended up publishing this book with Manchester University Press. Um, what was it called, Neil? It was called just called so Sovereignty and Superheroes. Um, and so that was my beginning into... So I'd, I'd, I'd had an interest in comics. It then turned into kind of a form of pedagogy and a kind of a bit of an intervention in the curriculum at Nottingham University, try to bring in something from the margins. And then... 
I suppose I started to become a comic scholar. Um, and and so from from around that time, probably the book came out in 2016. So from around 2014, I was probably publishing papers on superheroes and law. And I still am. I mean, one a paper came out last year in a law journal, mm. right, on legal storytelling and, and superheroes. So I still do that. And you're a bit of a Marvel expert now, aren't you? Well, yeah, Marvel was my preferred universe, I think. Um, although my favourite superhero is Wonder Woman and she's from DC. Um, and I'm not just virtue signalling there. <laughs> there, is a, there is a reason, because um, she has the most remarkable um, origin story. Um, 1941, she was written by William Moulton Marston, who was, a, who was married to Elizabeth Holloway. Um, and the origin story for Wonder Woman is that she was made from clay by her mother, Hippolyta. No intervention from any men. She was animated by the goddesses Aphrodite and Artemis, I think, brought to life. Um, and really it's about, it's a story about not only women's suffrage, right, because Elizabeth Holloway was a big suffragist. Um, it's also about women's reproductive rights and the decision to have a child when and where you want, right, and how you want. Um, and that that is even that's even stronger because Marston, at the time, also had an affair with a, a young student of his called Elizabeth Byrne. No, sorry, Ethel Byrne. And... To give you a sense of how peculiar the family was, Ethel and um, um, Marston's wife lived together after he died. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. So they were quite alternative, right? But the important thing about Ethel Byrne is that she was the niece of Margaret Sanger, and Margaret Sanger is the founder of Planned Parenthood in America, Right. And Ethel's uh, mother was imprisoned for distributing leaflets about contraception. That's interesting. Um, so, so he yeah. was surrounded by the sort of strong women, the activism for the suffragist movement, right? But also, he was surrounded by this these early days of Planned Parenthood and women's reproductive rights. And of course, Wonder Woman's birth or her origin is a total statement on on that. Mm. So. It, Again, it just shows you that these superheroes are not as dumb as people would like to think, that they are carriers of quite significant social and political critique. So, and plus she had great bangles, didn't she? Was it a bangle? Yeah, she, yeah. she wore bracelets. Bracelets, that's right. And they wore bracelets because the Amazons were um, enslaved by Hercules. And when they escaped, they continued to wear these because they were put in chains, manacles, right? So the bracelets became symbols of the manacles that they were put in and a reminder to never submit to men. So and she never did. She never, well, well, they made her submit, actually, in 2012. They changed the origin story and made her the daughter of Zeus. And Hippolyta sort of had Diana accidentally after sleeping with Zeus. So they got rid of the whole matriarchal history, the whole history of, of women's reproductive rights, the whole autonomy over reproduction, and they just threw it away. They would never do that to Batman. They would never do that to Superman. But they did it to Wonder Woman. And it shows you the state of gender politics today, right? Where mm. 1940, you could be doing something as radical as that. 2012, she's brought to heel and, and made the, the daughter of Zeus. Mm. And it infuriated me. Yes, no, I can imagine. I didn't know any of that. But moving on a bit, mm. um, your latest um, comics mm. uh, project is very interesting and very relevant to the University of Auckland and to the Centre of Brain Research here in the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. Mm. Uh, where's it at and what's going on? Well, yeah, that's quite an interesting thing. We might as well go back a little bit and explain where that came from because... Um, the last book I wrote was called Hate in Precarious Times. Um, subtitle was Mobilising Anxiety from the Alt-Right to Brexit. So I was interested in talking about the kinds of um, 
a kind of constellation of precarity or uncertainty or insecurity, right, that makes charismatic political figures seem particularly seductive, right? So figures that tell you you're great or that your country's great, right? Boris Johnson, Trump, all these types, right? Um, and the last chapter in that book, of the final precarity I talk about, is what I called epistemological precarity. So it's the insecurity, the fragility of our, our knowledge in the what we call the post-truth age, right? Where um, we have so-called alternative facts, disin disinformation is spread absolutely everywhere, um, we've got conspiracy theories, and even now we've got developments in AI which produces deep fakes, so we can't even believe what we see anymore, right? Everything is artificial and made up. And I think at the end of writing that book, it was a long three years just focusing on hate, and I, I was tired and I felt a little bit, I don't think it was good for my mental health, right? And I thought, well, you know, thinking about that, and it, I wrote that last chapter when the whole COVID thing was going on, right? So you had Susie and Toby doing their graphic medicine in, in relation to sort of science communication, public health information. Um, and, you know, they, they particularly Susie, right, because she was the woman, um, were being hounded by a lot of people. And, and, and that whole period was surrounded by disinformation and conspiracy theories. And I just thought, look, well, I need to be doing something about this. I need to, and I'd been, for a long time, I'd had this sort of, I'd been keeping an eye on these subfields of comic studies known as graphic science and graphic medicine. And I just thought, look, I've got to take my knowledge of comics and I've got to see if I can actually counter this epistemological precarity, counter this kind of post-truth age and see if I can do something to support the dissemination of science, right, and advocate for science. So I went to a workshop where we were looking for funding to set up what I, what I was calling the comics lab, and I still want to do that. So it's get a, a whole load of creatives together and a whole load of researchers and even people from outside DHBs, Auckland Council, whatever, and translate research and policy and information into comics. Right? But there, uh, Thomas Park at the um, Centre for Brain Research, he was also at the workshop because he, he wanted to do a project advocating for a brain tumour registry and other... Because we're the only country, developed country in the world that doesn't have a dedicated brain tumour registry. Right? We have a general cancer one. Um, and that's not helpful for researchers. A registry which tells... As how many people have it? Or yes, and, and of... presumably keeps... I mean, I don't, don't know how the registry would function, but it would presumably keep very specialist, specialised um, data about individual cases and what happened and so on, right? And um, I think a more focused registr registry would be very beneficial for the country and research, right? So he said, look, can you come in with me and see see if we can use comics? Uh, and I said, yeah, let's let's do that right because it, it's sort of what I'd gone there to do anyway right to support scientific research and rather than my sort of rather general idea here was a specific project so I said yeah let's do it so we got money from the university to set up the New, uh, Aotearoa New Zealand Neuro Oncology Group and we had the founding uh, meeting for, for, for that um, in Auckland the inaugural meeting and I was there talking about graphic medicine to all these brain surgeons and profess clinical professors and all this sort of stuff and I was thinking oh my god what on earth am I doing here talking <laughs> about this stuff but then what was lovely was um, uh, Brain Tumor Support did a panel where which is a charity New Zealand ch ch charity and, and they, they had um, patients and carers who were giving their personal testimony right and that's exactly what graphic medicine is about and what I was there to talk about. So I suddenly felt, oh, this is, you know, I should be here, right? And I followed them straight after. Um, and then I started talking to them and say, do you want to turn your stories into comics, right? Um, and they agreed. And so then I went off to the Health Research Council and put in a proposal there and got some money from them to do these testimonial comics and also a comic for um, Māori uh, readers, um, on symptoms and support networks for brain tumours. So we started that. We've just completed the first comic, which is possibly the driest comic ever created in the history of comics. We were asked by the brain tumour support to do a comic on the lab flow of tumour testing, right? Because they get 
all the time patients want to know what's happening where the tests are where it's gone and whatever and they can tell them but they just wanted an easy guide right and now they've got one yeah and so clinton turner gave us as like i gave us one slide from a powerpoint of all the different phases and i'm working with janina godan um aka um miss diabetes she works for the World Health Organization doing comics on, on diabetes for them. She's such a great artist, isn't oh, she? Oh, she's, she's brilliant. So she's brilliant. Mm. And she did, in her own style, she uses very, very bright colors. So she did this lab flow test comic virtually in pink, bright pink. <laughs> Which she likes to use, I know. <laughs> Which she, seen likes, her, she likes to use. And she, yeah, yeah, she, she likes mm. to use that. And, but, but it removed all the sort of cold institutional thing right they made immediately sort of humanized it and she she presented plenty of people within the comic to show all the different phases and the, and the extent of the human labor and so hopefully i think that's going to be successful because i don't i don't think there's anything like it in the world where right? will it come out how will people um, see it well it will be it will find a place on the university website i'm sure but it's going to be housed primarily um for the um Brain Tumor Support, the charity, is going to be housed with them on their website and there will be a downloadable PDF which you can sort of take and, and, and share. And you've but, got about seven more to do, haven't you? Oh, yeah, there's 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 one... I've got one on what is a brain tumour. We've got then we've got one, a specific one about advocating for the brain tumour registry. We've got one to do, which is going to be fascinating, about for children, explaining to them about behavioural changes in their parents. You're like, your parents are still there. They're just being driven by a gremlin at the moment because that's the specific thing about brain tumours, right? They Every form of cancer, every form of illness, right, affects somebody's personality, right? But brain tumours do it to a significant degree, right? Because, because it, it's your it, brain. Because it's, cause it's your brain, <laughs> It tends right? to control it you. It takes yeah. control mm. of the thing that controls you, mm. right? Um, so I think that's... That'll be good. And looking forward to doing the uh, the Māori comic with um, uh, Munra Tifata. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to keep doing more of them, I think, once we get settled in. And the more people realise what comics can do, how diverse they are, how varied they are, how fantastic they are for communicating. They're so clear, aren't they? Well, it's what so... we call multimodal, right? The, when we're sitting here, I'm now pointing my hands, right? I'm, we're using gesture... Facial expression, we use uh, what are called prox proxemics, how near or far we are from people, right? Um, that all depends on context. We use colour, we use clothing, we use not only speech and text, but we use intonation, sound, volume, all these kinds of... All of that can be presented within a comic, right? You can't do that just with text. You can't do anything with text apart from text. You might be able to change a font or... It puts something in italics, right? But you can't do all that. So it's multimodal, very, very rich, um, as well as all the affordances of the medium itself to do with page layout and the use of panels and all that, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. So I'm fantastic just... project mm. and um, uh, really such a worthwhile one. I'm looking forward to seeing it and seeing more of it. And if someone is interested to know more about any of this, who should they contact? Um, well, they can always email me, n.curtis at auckland.ac.nz. Um, they can go up to um, Heroes for Sale, a comic shop in Newmarket, which is in Railway Street, I believe. In Auckland. In Auckland. Um, I know they've definitely got Katie Green's Lighter Than My Shadow up there, which is about her anorexia extraordinary comic and and that will blow you away and make you realize what these comics are capable of but you could also visit the graphic medicine website the main um, organization it was founded in in the uk by a clinical doctor ian williams back in 2007 i think and now there's organizations organizations in japan italy Spain, but you can go to the graphic medicine website, and there's all kinds of examples of, of, of stuff there. So that's the place to that's the place to start. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for coming in, um, and I wish you all the best with that project. It sounds fantastic. Thank you very much for inviting me. You've been listening to the Research and Reason podcast. Stay up to date with the Faculty of Arts by following us on social media. Yeah.